Thank you. Th thanks, David. Now, just for me to understand who is in the room, how many of you are from the corporate sector? One, two, three, four, okay. How many of you are from the non-for-profit sector? The majority. And government? Okay, great. And how many of you attended our debate yesterday? One, two, three, four. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for coming this morning. Um, what I'd like to do today is to talk to you about the the increasing complexity and in what we call this new landscape between non-for-profit and for-profit. And I guess the appropriate part to start is to look at the, the, the evolution and the conversion between those two sectors, to look at the way CSI is driving the corporate partnership platform. And I want to talk to you about spiritual capital and look at the bigger picture. So if we go back in time, it's pretty obvious that, uh, you know, today the dominant players on the global sphere are the corporation. Uh, it hasn't been the case always, but it certainly is, is what's happening today. And if you look at some of the statistics which you've heard many times, I'm sure, but the first one only tell you that 51 of the largest economies in the world are corporations. So we are now facing with corporations that are the size of countries, or if not, if not bigger. Okay? So no wonder that the government and the community are asking increasingly for corporates to be res socially responsible. And in fact, corporate themselves are realizing, and it's been the topic of the last two days, that it is good business to actually be acting as a good CSR agent. If we look at the role of government, because it's quite important to understand globally and in Australia what, what is the, uh, the evolving role of government. And what we're observing is that less and less government are getting involved in the delivery of services. They are shifting from service delivery to outsources of program. And, and, and that means that more and more new players, corporate players and non-for-profit are winning tenders and delivering program that used to be run by government. And we're not talking small bickies. If you look at some of the statistics on the slide, uh, that's happening in Australia, that's happening in the UK, and that's increasingly happening in the US. Okay? And of course, the role of government is continuing to look at funding new seed program and also looking at initiative and tax incentive to support the non-for-profit sector. Well, what does it mean for the, the, the non-for-profit sector is more and more we are, for those who want to have a, a say and, and, and a, play, a role to play in that uh, outsourcing game, we are being called to, to run large, complex operations. And I'll give you just one, one example. In Australia, the Job Network program, when it was outsourced, was a $1.6 billion contract. I think it was one of the most uh, significant outsourced contracts from government after the, the armament contract. So, which meant for Mission Australia that we decided to go and tender for it. We got a contract worth about 80 million a year and we expanded our operation all across Australia. And that's not, that's an easy thing to do because in 10 years' time we've moved from an, an organization that was running an expenditure budget of about 45 million to an, an expenditure budget of 200 million this year. So you can imagine the complexity of growing and developing your business at for other pace, which also means that we have to become much more professional, accountable, and you know, and, and be as, as I guess as efficient in the corporate sector because our key competitors in that field are the corporates. So you can, you can start to get a sense that the landscape is shifting from what was used to be traditional charity landscape, corporate landscape, to something more more significant. And that slide gives you an idea of what, what I mean by that. You know, traditionally, the corporate sector have been concentrating on, on making profits, and still are, but they are starting to look at you know, how do they implement their corporate social responsibility platform. So they're either developing large foundations or partnering with non-for-profit to do that. And on the other side, the, the, the non-for-profit sector are looking more and more for new income stream to develop their sustainability in financial stability platform. So they're also looking at developing businesses that so generate profits and they can re, re uh, in, um, channel those, the profit into, into the community. And what's in the middle is a CSR, which is becoming basically, from my perspective, uh, the opportunity for corporate and non-for-profit to be partnering on a larger scale. And at the same time, you know, probably some of you understand that corporations are also using lots of um, clever marketing tools as well as um, dollars and to, to develop brands that we call enriching brands, which have a very strong community uh, focus. So, 
you know, we are not, we are not any longer in the 60s or the 70s where those three sectors had a clear demarcation line. We are operating in an environment globally where it's be becoming increasingly difficult to understand what is the limit uh, for, from, from the operating environment perspective from those three sectors, and particularly between the corporate and the non-for-profit. Okay? So, and these slides tell you that from the perspective of corporate partnership, we've seen a significant evolution also from what used to be, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, philanthropic involvement to eventually sponsorship, course and marketing and CSR. And CSR is really, from my perspective, you know, the, the heart and, the, and, and we could say the soul of corporates. You know, we're not talking about giving $50,000 to 50 charities. We're talking about a large sum of money which is strategically involved to help the corporation to, to implement their CSR platform. And for us, for the non-for-profit sector, we have to be able to, 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 to partner with those corporations on, on multiple grounds, and I'm going to explain that in a minute. So the consciousness which used to be often, you know, 10 years ago, the chairman of a corporate decided that, you know, he's, he wants to support the Sydney Opera uh, Ballet and, 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 you know, pass that through the board to what we call now the CSR consciousness, which is really where the CEO and the senior executive of, of large corporations spend significant time debating, analyzing and measuring, you know, where do they want to involve their, their, their dollars and how do they want to do it and what does the accountability around those issues. We've, so we see a significant shift from philanthropic giving to corporate social responsibility engagement. Okay? This, is, this gives you an idea of, of you know, if you look at the drivers of CSR for the for-profit, and people have talked about that extensively in the last two days, you know, you, you, you can see that it's about ethical values, innovation, learning, employees, motivation, reputation, cost-saving, economic value, access to capital, and risk management. So what, what are the areas where the non-for-profit can actually have an impact? And they are in, to, in relation to ethical and values in the concept of spiritual capital, and I'll talk about that in, later on. Certainly in relation to innovation and learning. Employees motivation, it's, it's one of the biggest, uh, biggest um, opportunity today for the non-for-profit and the for-profit to partner on what we call employee community days. And Westpac, which is here in the room, has been one of the leaders in, in that field. Uh, but also, you know, as we are in the age where, uh, and we've seen that with Nike and other brands that have, you know, over the years spent millions of dollars on brand advertising and other one or two critical issues have seen their brand value and the, the capitalization of their brand value going down very quickly because of what was happening in Indonesia. We, we, are, we, we know that now consumers can go on the net fast and they can access to information that they didn't have the ability to do before and so corporations have to rely on good stories more and more to manage their brand. And again, I think the NGO has a role to play in that. So I'll give you just a couple of examples of how Mission Australia have been partnering with corporates to help them on their, on their CSR platform. And I'll start with innovation and learning. The Mission Australia recently opened uh, our new homeless inner city uh, program. Uh, we were looking at uh, a renovation of one of our icons program in the 70s called um, Campbell House, which is looking at a homeless residential pro and we, we looked at we looked at it, we studied we studied and researched the new service delivery model around the world and we came up with a program that was worth seven million dollars. So the problem was for us in how do we get seven million dollars to actually run it. And this is where we looked at corporate partnership as well as individual partners. And the model that we use is not the traditional model where you just go out and ask for donations and then and, and that's about the only focus that you look at. We've, we've, do, we've, we've put together a three-dimensional model where we're obviously looking for cash but we're also looking for income, expertise and networks. And over a period of a year, 12 months roughly, we raised uh, $7 million using a capital, capital uh, campaign consultant to support us, but basically using our networks with our current corporate partners to help them to get on board with this program. If you look at reputation and brand, again, we were involved recently with a partnership with the Sydney Money Herald, and we launched uh, a publication, which some of you may have seen in the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, and the age, two million 
publication around Australia. Um, and again, our corporate partners bought advertising in it, which meant that for us it was basically a cost neutral exercise, but a fantastic opportunity to talk about our stories and about Mission Australia and what we're doing, in particular from our client perspective. If you look at uh, what we've done with Macquarie Bank in terms of our uh, research and social policy unit, uh, we have a partnership with them, which is a three-year partnership, where Macquarie Bank has accepted to pay for our operational costs, which is a value of 250k a year. But this partnership has grown, and this is one of the messages I wanted to give you this morning, is that you know the times where partnerships between non-for-profit and for-profit were very much single focus, which was cash-driven, is gone. You know, I think if you want to successfully manage partnership in the future, you have to really look at how you can leverage from a cash perspective to in-kind pro bono networking, uh, using using your maybe your corporate partners to support you with your social advocacy statements, etc., etc., etc. And you can see in that slide that's about four or five dimension. And when you look at evaluating your partnerships after a period of two to three years, you can see that the value for the organisation is significant. Now, if you only look at the cash value, that's only one dimension. But if you st if you find ways to measure the income uh, and the pro bono area, you can you can you can add probably or double or triple the value of the partnerships, and we work with PwC to help us to set up uh, a, a sophisticated way to do that. Yeah, that's a cash contribution. You can see in the top. Uh, no, actually, it's not here. The cash contribution is 250k a year. The staff engagement is about worth about 100k cash a year. Um, Macro Bank help us with uh, with the MS centers, and they pro provided a couple of the executive to help us with the capital gain, and that was a value of again about 50k cash. And then there's a range of other streams of activity that we do with them. So the overall value for us of the partnership, not on, in cash, it's probably about 500k. But when you add the other component, you you, you go quickly to 750 plus. So what we have to do also is to do a lot of work with our brand, and I talked about that yesterday, because if for Mission Australia, what does it mean to be, to be sustainable? You know, and if Mission Australia is, is uh, engaged in a CSR platform, or what we call a sustainability platform, we have to look at what, what is our key brand message. Are we talking about problems, or are we talking about solution and long-term outcomes for our clients? So we did a significant amount of work in the last two years to refocus our brand to basically tell our hero's story. You know, our client's story and celebrating the outcome from our perspective and from their perspective, which is quite a, a new thinking for the for the charity sector because obviously for many, many years the fundraisers have been saying, look, if you don't concentrate on, you know, telling the problems over and over and over, you won't raise the money because people are not, I mean, the, the community is not necessarily um, going to support uh, positive advertising. Well, we, we've actually gone against that and we've proved that it's not the case. And what, what we've seen through our research and through talking to our stakeholders is that, in fact, the community, in particular the corporate sector, is, is starting to ask increasing questions about, you know, if I'm going to invest in your organization, I want some a social outcome in return. I don't want to be told every year that the problem is compiling and there's no solution for it. And same with our donors. They're starting to look for 20 years. You've sending us the same sort of appeals later. The problem then seems to be getting better. Why would I keep giving you to the same amount of dollars every year? So by we're focusing on telling the good story and focusing on our clients, we've been able to shift you know, the, the position of our brand. And of course, you know, our sustainability platform is, is very much depending on, on income stream. And we've looked at uh, course of the marketing as an exercise. We've done a, a campaign on use to start with Harvey Norman and Sony Foundations, which raised $500,000 in about six weeks. And they use advertising and buying powers. They used, obviously, products of Sony for about six weeks, which every product around Australia was a percentage of that sales would go to Mission Australia. And, and again, it was a very powerful way to look at, a bit laterally to look at, you know, is CRM, a CRM cause of the marketing, is it an effective way to help corporations to deliver their CSR platform as well as to produce cash and resources for the non-profit sector. If you look at that slide, you can see that, you know, 
again, for us, one of the critical things that we've got to do is to look at our supply relationship. We're a large organization. We've got 3,000 employees. We've got a budget of 20 million plus. So we obviously have a lot of suppliers. And we've done a lot of work in the last two years to either renegotiate our contract to save cost or work with organizations like Westpac and look at their skill set and help and ask them to come to help us with some of our, our needs. For example, Westpac was one of the, provided, you know, their top experts in helping us to relaunch our, our website, you know. Now, if we had to do that on our own, first of all, we, did, we didn't have the skill based in-house. It would have cost us probably 250k plus, and I'm not sure that we would have achieved the same result. So, thanks to organizations like Westpac and others, LGL, for example, who's been sort of um, helping us with our electricity bill, uh, for free for some of our services in winter, we are finding that there's actually ways to save money. Again, if you engage with your partners in the right, at the right time, and if you build trusting relationships that are evolving over a period of years, so we're not talking one year involvement, which we mean in three years. And, and the last, the last part is, you know, in terms of our governance issues, we came to a place where we had to actually look at our sustainability report um, because, you know. As I said yesterday, we can't be going to cooperation all the time and say, look, what, what are you guys doing about CSR without looking ourselves about, you know, what is our renewable energy policy? You know, how do we prepare to cost, cost in, in, in our fuel consumptions? You know, what is our social way to report on, on outcomes, etc., etc. So we've decided to, uh, to get on that journey. We'll have said yesterday we've employed Sharon Jackson, which used David Grayson's sort of seven steps. Um, and at the moment we're about, uh, we've done one, two, three, four, and we're embarking on five. Now it's been an extraordinary journey for us because it's really basically put sustainability at the heart of our corporate planning. And I think, you know, in the future, if we project ourselves in the future, we'll find that it's been one of the most significant shift that Mission has, has, has done in recent time. Um, the drivers, as, as, I, as we've seen before, are not dissimilar to the corporate sector. The scoping has been an interesting area for us, and we've looked at the CRI index program to help us. But of course, it needs adaptation for the non-profit sector. There's actually no tools globally that are designed for the non-profit sector. So we are, we are looking and engaging a range of, of players to look at, you know, can we actually design the tools which will eventually be an index for the non-profit sector. And, and it would be fantastic that you know, in the next two to three years if we could get this outcome. So I, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, about spiritual capital because that's an area that I'm quite interested and passionate about. Um, there's a, 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 somebody from Oxford, uh, of actually two key players in that field from Oxford have came up with the concept of spiritual capital in the last two years. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, emotional intelligence and the work that Daniel Goldman and Annie McKee have done in the US and all around the world. Well, Dan Azoa came up with a new concept which is what you call spiritual capital, which is looking at, you know, what is the, what is the meaning uh, of, of, so if corporations are engaged in, in building, you know, their sort of strategies to develop their businesses, what, you know, is there a meaning behind it? Um, Dana is actually a neuroscientist. She's done a lot of work on, on the brain wave and she's and, and understanding how the brain has actually three three components. One which is a, a, a serial oscillation part which is corresponding to the IQ, then the, the part of the brain that corresponds to the EQ, emotional intelligence, and then she's fine with other scientists around the world that there's actually another part which is called the unity brain that looks at finding meaning into, uh, into all the different parts of, of, your, of your, your brain and yourself and bringing those meaningful conversations at the heart of what drives you. Okay, uh, and and if you look at the the implication for that in terms of you know medicine, corporation, etc., etc., we're going to see in the future that you know more and more people are going to are going to look for meaning when they go to work, and certainly our research for Generation Y is looking is showing that you know this 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 generation does not want only to work for a package; they want to learn, they want to grow their understanding about community issues, they want to, if possible, look at their spiritual journey. And so increasingly they're going to be looking at ways that corporations can support that. 
Okay. And you know, if you talk to some of the uh, large, large service firms in Sydney, they're already struggling because they're finding that people in their in the early 20s don't want to work 80 hours a week with a view to become a partner in six years' time. They have different values. They have different aspirations. And unless, you know, and, and in, in, at the time where you're looking at an aging population and the race for talents, uh, you know, unless you're starting to reflect and engage on some of those, you know, what you could call wide brain activities, um, I think you're going to find that you know, some corporations are struggling and online for profit are struggling in the future, I'm talking, you know, five to ten years, to actually attract and retain those, those talents. Now, some, some organizations of like the Body Shop, for example, have done that very well. And they've built a culture which is so focusing on, on spiritual capital that actually the people, that, the employees that work for them are sort of, you know, social activists <laughs> in their own field. Um, so they, there's a, somebody in Sydney called Jenny Zapala, which some of you may know, which actually work for Westpac at the moment, that has come up with the concept of, you know, looking at, at SQ as, as a, a spiritual, spiritual intelligence. And again, there's a range of books, if you're interested in that area, that are written about spiritual intelligence. But what he's saying is financial and economic capital are linked with IQ, social capital is more linked with EQ, and then sort of spiritual capital is a dimension of SQ. So it's, 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 it's a new way. And I know that in the US, uh, in Harvard, in Yale University, there's a lot of research at the moment in terms of, you know, what sort of CEOs are we going to need for the future to operate globally very complex businesses. And not only complex technically speaking, but, but culturally speaking. So they are sort of looking at how can we actually uh, measure SQ and, and what sort of leadership do we need in the future. And I'll talk a bit, bit about that in terms of the bigger picture issue. Because basically if you're running a, a global business, which is operation in Asia, in Europe, in South America, um, you are going across so many different cultures, so many different religious you know, um, cultures, that you have to have some people that have the understanding, what I call the MSQ understanding, and cultural understanding, to actually lead people, inspire them, and unleash their sort of uh, passion and spirit to actually deliver for your organization. Um, McKinsey has done a lot of work in that area. They've developed a, a leadership program that's based on self-transformation. Um, I don't know if you've heard about Michael Rennie, which used to be running um, McKinsey in Sydney. Michael had a, a major life-threatening disease, uh, went out in the wilderness for a couple of years to get better. I came back and, and used all the, the all the um, his journey and all the things that he'd learned in his life and developed a, a, a a training and a leadership program that is now one of the best selling McKinsey program in the world and is now working in the US with a large foundation and large corporation. And it is based on, on what they call self transformation, which is, you know, what is it in you that stops you to be a great leader? Because, you know, we, we are finding increasingly that it's not, you cannot actually reach a stage of consciousness with just academic training. It has to be about experiential learning. You know, and this is also where the I guess the interest in spirituality is also um, uh, increasing in Australia and, and all over the world. You know, if people have emotional baggages, how do they transform those baggages so they can lead people differently? We all have scars from our childhood. We all have been at at certain level, you know, uh, at facing very difficult emotional issues or challenges. Now, if you don't heal those part in you. Well, they're going to impact the way you relate with people, the way you manage people, the way you, you, your, your worldview. And if, you, if you're interested in quantum physics, it is very much what quantum physicians are, are, are talking about, that you create your world in relations to the way you think your world. So your reality is actually not the real reality. It's your reality from your perspective. So if you are leading a large corporation or a large NGO, you know, what sort of culture do you want to set in your organization? And it's no point saying, well, I want to have an organization that has a built, you know, is based on trust and blah, 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 blah. But if you're unable to lead it yourself, and if your executive team is unable to, to also, you know, walk the talk, then you're not going to be successful in building that in your organization. So some of the new leadership um, 
in the leadership training that coming out of those uh, top university is actually looking at this self-transformation model, which is a bit challenging, but I think it's, it's significantly needed, and I'm going to demonstrate that in the next slide. So, sorry, but before that, this is what we've done with Mission Australia. We, we looked at our values, we looked at what values the, the organisation need to be actually uh, living, and we developed a leadership program that has numbers of phases. We've used, obviously, emotional intelligence as, as a way, as 360 way to, to, to help to understand our people. We've developed a mentoring and coaching culture, uh, and now we are looking at embedding our values into a, a, a bit further down, which means, you know, how do we match values and behavior? And I said that yesterday, you know, one of the challenges that organizations like us and others are facing is that, like, for example, is your values is about delivering results with a certain set of values, and then some of your people are actually making their KPI, but outside of that value, you know, set, what, what do you do? Do you keep them on board, particularly their financial KPIs, because as you know, everybody li leaves the dial with financial KPIs. So you have to come with a, with a heart, you know, you have to, you've got to actually face it, that difficult situation and decide, okay, is it better for the long run to actually work with that person to try to change their behavior so they match the value of the organization? And if it's impossible, are you prepared to let them, let them go? Taking the risk that if they really deliver on the financial part, taking the risk that you know, the next person won't be as good on that level, but we work within the value set of the organization. So there are difficult issues, but I think if we want to, again, to, to work the talk with integrity, I think that they're the question that any organization needs to ask themselves. We, we've also worked with an organization, with um, PwC, and develop a program called Elevate. And this is another example of, you know, leading to spiritual capital, which is looking at, at our home, some of our street kids who are obviously facing a range of issues and matching them with future leaders of PwC. And this Elevate program has been quite extraordinary because it's not only about the future leaders of PwC giving their time and effort to help our clients, it's also about the skill sets that our clients can bring to PwC future leaders. Because what, I, what we know is that a lot of those firms that employ people straight out of university or background, um, you know, those, those young, very bright, IQ-driven uh, uh, people don't have a huge amount of experience of life. So when you move them from from a, 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 when you move them into management role and managing people or large complex operation, they haven't got the skill set to do that properly. So PwC was looking at you know can we not only you know use our, our, our CSR platform but build a partnership with Mission Australia where we're helping their clients but we're also helping ourselves and providing some very good feedback to our, to our senior leadership in terms of, you know, succession planning, we are the top young leaders that will actually make it to the top. And that's only one program, and they've got a suite of programs. We also use volunteering as a way to uh, help, again, all our partners to come into our organization at the call phase and get an understanding of community issues and also value add from their perspective so they feel really good about themselves. And what we've seen through that is often it also helps us to break the myth of what people think about you know, homelessness, for example. Uh, and we've got a range of, of stories that I can tell you about that. I mean, basically, if you understand that the average homeless man or woman in the inner city in Sydney or around Australia is, only, is under 30, you can understand that um, they're not exactly the stereotype person that most of us who are not necessarily informed about homelessness to think. And if you go further and you understand that a lot of those people have actually had jobs, some of them in New York on the stock exchange, making a huge amount of dollars, getting into cocaine addiction, losing money, breaking down the family support, etc., etc., all the way to the street of Sydney then it's easier for people to start to relate and to say, oh, look, you know, I, you know, in my family, I know five people who are acutely depressed. You know, it could be me tomorrow. So if I start to build some relationships, 
you in relationship with some of our uh, or clients on Mission Australia, I'm actually learning you know, resilience skills and a range of things that may help me in my life, and I'm also feeling very good about myself. So let's look at the bigger picture, because this is where spiritual capital, I think, is probably the most uh, interesting, I mean, the development I'm going to be the most interesting. What, what are the five big challenges, and, and uh, Michael Hastings talked a lot about that in the last two days. You know, we're, we're looking at, from my perspective, five potential bombs that, you know, could, could, could tick any time. Scale of resources, water and oil, climate change, elevation of poverty, which, you know, some of us, we could link it to terrorism, and epidemic health. Do you know that if the bird flu is, is transmitted from human to human, it's going to have an absolutely amazing impact on workforce around particularly developing countries, and, and large organizations are already planning to replace half of their workforce if this scenario is actually occurring. So what it means that you know, corporation and the non-for-profit large global players, I said, look, you know, we've got to take that seriously. It's not any longer an issue of, oh, you know, it's an earthquake in Asia or floods in Bangladesh. It's actually potentially huge, um, I mean, any of those areas have a huge impact into my businesses. And if I looked at risk management for the next 10 years, I've got to really look at, you know, I'm going to be a player and work with other organizations or with government NGOs to actually try to reduce those risks. And so, again, organization or conf you know, there's a set of conferences around the years that I said, what are the skill sets that I require for this leadership? Because it's really about political leadership, corporate leadership, and, and the non-for-profit leadership. And what people are saying is that um, maybe we need to look at leaders that have the, the capacity to understand those issues and to do something about it and, and go beyond what I call our human, humanist fragility. And if you look at those four people on that slide, you probably, if I ask you, you know, what are the top five leaders or ten leaders in, in the 20th century, I'm sure that at least two or three of those people will have come up in your mind. Now, what those four leaders had a very high SQ sort of um, embedded value. And that's what made them, you know, transcending their humanness to, to more sort of putting the cause always fit. <coughs> and all of them had a pretty difficult time, but they never waved, they never compromised their vision. So we are seeing around the years, uh, around the world, you know, grassroots example of leadership based on, on SQ and spiritual intelligence. <coughs> so. I think the future, from my perspective, is about the conversion of the sector. It is about the effectiveness of, of cross-sector partnership on the global global level. And there's a couple of examples here, which you know are on the on the, the periphery of spiritual capital, uh, British. Uh, BP, Beyond Petroleum, shifting from where they were to uh, renewable energy, and of course Coca-Cola uh, using their, their, um, their networks in part of the world to help with using uh, the ads. And another very good example is, is Pfizer, you know, Pfizer that is really globally getting around the support, the, the issue of hate and how we can really spend resources, networks, and, and, and develop infrastructure and, and use our, our human, human I mean, uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge management to support the, the fight against uh, heads. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that the future is really about, you know, cross partnerships and it's about every sector taking its place and taking its responsibility and understanding that, you know, we are all interdependent in this world and and we can continue to guess to act as if there is all this issue or not. <coughs> Excuse me. That all those issues didn't really have a, a future impact on our businesses. And I'll leave you with a quote from Mandela just to finish on this spiritual capital concept.
Thank you. Do you have any questions? Sorry, I've been a bit fast because I was aware that I had a lot of slide and I hope I haven't overwhelmed you with information, but I'd, I'd love to take some questions now, if you have any. Okay, so um, certainly in terms of donation, we did get some donation support uh, from our corporate partners. I think it was certainly very well received. Some of our partners didn't choose to come on board this time, and I think they were a um, bit disappointed that they made their own choice. Uh, certainly those of our portrait in the publications uh, are very keen to do it again. Uh, from the non-for-profit sector, I think um, people are thinking, well, why don't we do it ourselves? Um, uh, got a couple of feedback where people thought that it was about the charity sector and when they, they d d turned the page and said it was only about Mission Australia, they, they were a little bit uh, surprised. Uh, for our brand, it's just been a win-win on a level because uh, it's really talking, telling the story about our clients. Um, from Fairfax perspective and the edge, it's also worked very well. They had, they've been inundated with uh, letters to the editors saying, you know, this is so good to see good stories in the paper. You know, because people need hope. People want to read positive, positive stories. You know, so that, and from our, you know, one story to tell you is we had uh, a phone call from a gentleman in Bondi, which uh, was about to commit suicide. And uh, as he was, he was seriously considering that he, he turned around and saw this bin, and on the top of the bin there was this publication. And he took it and started to read it. And he realized that he was not alone. And there was a huge amount of people around us, so we had the same problem. And he called us. And, was, and just for that example, we felt it was so valuable that we got involved with that. So it's very difficult to measure the whole impact, but for us it's definitely been a win win on all, on all grounds. We haven't had one negative feedback from, from this publication. It's not many years apart, it's happening today. Um, okay, social enterprise, obviously competing with government tenders. So what we see, for example, training and employment, we see you know, Manpower and Drug International are competing with, with Salvation Army and Mission Australia. So, you know, 10 years ago, Drake and, and Manpower were really clearly the operating environment, clearly around training and recruitment, etc., etc. Well, now, you know, and for us, it's a sort of way to, to increase our, our income. Uh, other form of revenue, some non for profit are buying businesses and running them efficiently and, you know, and using the profit and recycling them into the community. Um, but we're also seeing that corporations are setting up large foundations that are, have the scale. I mean, Bill Gates Foundation, $1.3 billion. It's got, it's got the scales of, a, of five times the Salvation Army in Australia. So, you know, it's, as you say, it's, it's very difficult, it's increasingly difficult to look at, at straight demarcation line. Um, and, I, I, you know, and I can tell you another example is that the corporate sector in some part, and Michael Porter from Harvard Business School has written a lot about that, have decided in some ways to go on their own. And Pfizer, for example, bought invested $8 million in Brooklyn to renovate a plant, to buy the security in the subway, to buy a hospital, to buy a school, to develop housing, <coughs> simply because they were operating out of an equivalent of red firm, productivity of the plant was very inefficient, nobody wanted to live there, but no, no businesses wanted to be around them, and after five years they got them on the back. Why? Because of real estate values and business efficiency. But they went on their own. They didn't actually partner with NGOs. Vodafone in Africa is running program, micro credit program using their mobile technology to be credit cards. They're doing it on their own. They're not doing it with a with opportunity international or, or the non for profit sector. So 
who knows what's going to happen in 10 years' time, but I think the bigger issue is, you know, those five critical issues for the world, it's going to come to a time where corporates are going to say, look, we've got to take control, because if we don't, we might lose 50% or 20% or 10% of our assets globally. Now, can we run it with, in partnership with government and the, the non-for-profit, which is a preferable option, but if they can't manage it, they might decide to get together with five or six other conglomerates or corporates and, and, and run campaigns at the scale that we've never seen. So. Thank you very much, Eric. And, um, if I could just close by uh, asking you to thank you, Eric. I think it's been uh, a, sh a short and somewhat quick journey. Um, we so often think of the relationship between the not-for-profit sector and the for-profit sector and indeed government and the third sector as being relationships of cash flow, of being pressure and power groups. I think what Eric's done is uh, remind us that the people who find themselves in the corporate sector and the people who find themselves in the not-for-profit sector are number one the same people, you and me. And, and number two, we are a multi-dimensional species. And that spiritual uh, quotient, if you like, uh, is a far stronger linking factor than might be the most elaborate proposal or the most uh, ornate uh, evaluation. And my firm has done some evaluation work with um, uh, Mission Australia, and I have to say the strength of their programs is very much the strength of their mission. So thank you very much. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A short break, just a quick five minutes. Now, during this time, the session which I'm going to uh, uh, facilitate, I have that word, um, it's going to be a little bit different in the way we do it. Um, and there's going to be some seating pre arrangements while you're out for five minutes. So if you wouldn't mind popping your bags up the back, um, nothing too well, too heavy and challenging, you're leaving the budget paper at home. But the other thing we would ask you to do, I would ask you to do, is when you come back in in three, four, five minutes' time, I'm going to ask you to leave your shoes at the door. And I'll talk to you when you come back in for that. Okay. Now, half of you now will head for the lifts and not come back. <laughs> and we are not about to uh, get uh, too deep in any or there's no way you can bowl, I swear to God, it's quite fun. And nonetheless, uh, there's a little bit of bowling, so if you can bowl, you know, I appreciate it. But so please take your bag and uh, you can do that when you come in. Thank you very much. We'll see you in five.
Please come up to the front. We're only occupying these two dying halls. Uh, these now, what I need to ask you to do is organize yourselves. It's going to take a second. Uh, some of you are from corporate, and some of you are from non profits, and some of you are from government. Eric, thank you very much for the fabulous talk for the next minute. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is to do the sorting here. The reason we've got the seats in this configuration is we're going to have a bit of dialogue and discourse. So we're going to do it in a particular way, which I'll explain in a second. What I'd like to do, if you don't mind, if you don't mind indulging you for the process of this, I'd like to ask all of us who are primarily coming from the for-profit sector to sit up here on these benches, those of us who are primarily coming to the not-for-profit sector on these, these benches here, him is undecided what comes from government. I've only got two here. 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 i Okay, thank you very much for that indulgence. Um, normally when people say things like move the chairs and take your shoes off, I'd shudder at this and um, you know, head to the door, but um, I'm not very sure helpful in some of these things, so I'll explain why in a second. Um, David Morris is my name. Thank you for your time. You're investing a lot of time in these sessions, uh, and what I'm going to do is to put you maximise your return for that investment. We'll talk about how many is part of that in a moment. What I want to do right from the start is explain that the reason we've asked for the shoes off the front of the door is how the terms that I find in the is there's something about shoes that's probably a relative armour or something so that when you've got your shoes on, there's no defence against the world around you. So this little protected space and time, what we're asking you to do is to feel a bit more felt like it is. And so part of the way to do that is just to take the shoes off and just relax down the middle of the field. Uh, and we do really have a bit of chat and house rules that we're asking people to tell us how they really should be is, rather than the vein of research that says we all know, people find second guess what the correct answer is in the form format accordingly. So that's what we're trying to get under So on this side we have the non profit sector primarily, and on this side we have the for profit sector primarily, the regular format that we have for profit sector primarily, and we are under the title of all our government. <laughs> so this is our arrangement, those of you just joining us. If you're primarily from a non-for-profit, you're on this side of the house. If you're primarily a for-profit, you're on this side of the house. Uh, and if you're on the other side of the government, and I've swear to God, the government said, you know you're not on the side, we don't have a company. Um, that's where you sit. So that's what we're doing for that. What I'd like to do is just introduce the topic. Now, it's about measurement, but it's not about measurement in a vacuum. And we're going to think mostly about uh, why that's not a vacuum rather than about the technology of measurement per se. Okay, so I'm going to pose a few questions. Uh, at the core of this um, uh, presentation, not the right word, this engagement, I'm going to pose some questions through it, and they're like this. We're asking what value uh, performance measurement around CSR can provide. So it goes straight to the heart of the discourse uh, we've had so far it's about value. So those who have just come in, we've got two things we're asking you to do. One is keep your shoes off. The other is if you're for profit, you're over here. If you're not for profit, you're on this side. And if you're government, you're in that middle leaning section there. So if you just move, look, explain what I said. So these are the three questions we're asking ourselves. Uh, what are some models around measurement that you might use? Uh, and how do you decide what performance measurement system, I think the word system very advisable, is going to be useful for you? This is the sort of issues that we're going to work around. Uh, but I have to say, I'm not standing here and going to give you the answer. That would be a very foolish thing to attempt to do. What I'm going to do is work with you to think through some of these things and hopefully, as stakeholders in this session, hopefully, I'm going to tear it back in. Sorry, so I'm making an assumption here. You'll be able to walk away with some, uh, some, some connectivity, some ideas, some better practice thinking around measurement in the area of CSR. Okay. I should say, in my background, which is a uh, sort of social anthropology, I spent a lot of time working with indigenous organisations, and I find the sort of discourse model works much better than works better in this area. 
So I'm thinking about the value of measurement and its issues like, is your strategy working? Are there benefits or disbenefits that you're not aware of? Uh, what are your stakeholders needing to know? Uh, and in order to what? And it's a very stakeholder-based approach that I'm going to take with you. And it's a bit functional in the way to put it. The fundamental question I'm going to be putting is, what do I your stakeholders? And what is the nature of their state? And what do they need to know in order to exercise that state in an informed manner? That's the sort of direction we're coming, up, coming from, and I'll explain it so soon. Uh, what decisions will you make? What information do you need to know in order to make those decisions? So again, it's a very functional approach. Uh, informed decision making, we're assuming that it's uninformed decision making. Uh, and finally, if you're shifting, as I think we are fundamentally doing here, towards more sustainable uh, models of working, and you track that shift towards sustainability. So there's the sorts of interests, sort of drivers to life around measurement that we're paying attention to. There are others, of course, but these are the ones we're focusing on. So we're talking about measurement, but we're filling in the back end. I'm going to ask you to do this, and this is why we're in these two, um, uh, two, uh, two sorry, uh, segments here. I'm going to ask you to just have a few minutes talking, not to me so much, but with each other, around this issue of just who your stakeholders are. And uh, talk about the sorts of issues that are important to you. Uh, and we'll get to that through two channels. The first one is to ask ourselves, well, if we're going to be measuring the things we do, the progress we make, the results in our work in relation to corporate social responsibility, what sort of value do we actually see? Nothing that is. So, the awesome activity requires a bit of money, requires distraction, if you like. But we need to understand what the value is. So, what I'd ask you to do is answer this question, or pose this question yourself a high value from, for us, for me, a value that's important to us in measuring the work we do, the results we get, and put the social responsibility in our organisation, what we do. Don't tell me, what I'd ask you to do is. Take okay, two minutes uh, and talk about it with someone who's in here. So you're talking to people from the same sector, you need to see how they reflect back on each other. I want to give you two minutes if you don't mind doing that. Um, I would have liked to have done a sort of self introduction session too, of who you're sitting next to, where they come from, and the problem they need to see each other's community time, and just have to go past that, so perhaps they can come up with this too. So you may need to say, well, I'm so and so, I'm from such and such an organisation, and for us, value of mission is. I'd like to let this be a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a Thank <laughs> you. 
measurement in CSR in particular, what I wanted to suggest to you is there's four directions you can come from in this, uh, and it helps me to think of a sort of north, south, uh, east, west model, the news model. Um, we see a lot of measures that are top down, we see others that are coming in from the right field, I'll talk about that in the left field and the south and the bottom up. So it's just a little mental map for me, if you like, it helps me think of this. If you're in a position of wanting to do measurement, you I was making an assumption here that your organisation has an interest in measuring what you're doing. I think it's a fairly good assumption, still. Um, 
what I would call top down. And this is not by the way of value judgment. This is just my little mental mapping to say top down is good or bad. I'm just saying this is the way of thinking about it. Uh, there are mandatory or voluntary sets of indicators or methodologies that you can uh, deploy. And some of these you know about, others you may not. Um, I'm thinking perhaps of the uh, Global Reporting Initiative, which many of you know about. Um, interestingly, very stakeholder driven operation and quite a number of indicators that have been created from global stakeholder discourse and the specialty areas around particular sectors. Uh, indices, the Corporate Responsibility Index, which has been talked about. Talk so here are sets of indicators you can effectively buy into the pre existing sets of indicators and you can provide data to address these. Uh, they have values, what it gives the values is what you want. And uh, we've had other people in the scene so forth, we have to read the things if you like, the Dow uh, uh, Jones, the way that does Dow Jones, sustainable. Now, which of these are used, of use to you? It depends very much on who you are and what you're doing, and perhaps they're at least used to other means, it's up to you. Uh, accountability, the um, London firm, Fork and Shepherd, it's Wharf, the Dolphin System, the Dave. They always just have the word order to be like accounting for you know, the inputs and outputs from the way, I guess. All of these I can find references for you, by the way, anytime. Uh, London Benchmarking Group, for a number of years I ran a benchmarking group in Australia using the London Benchmarking Group model. Uh, great accounting system based on the 1990s precept that people get upset if it's uh, for the good of the community and it's actually for the good of the company. So we placed the set of the old regime while we get over it. So this goes in this box, that goes in that box, everyone benefits. Uh, we've perhaps moved on, things like what integrated with systemic accounting so it's, uh, so in my view, wonderful accounting based model for the 1990s, but we've moved on since then. Uh, and of course there are standards around um, uh, Australian national standards, the CSR standards, uh, and there are high international standards, ISO 14001 and so on, which may give you some framework for creating measurement systems that can give you benefit. They're essentially sort of top-down approaches, I can characterise them as that. From the bottom up, on the other hand, I would call this a more inductive approach, where the starting point is, what are we doing? What are we doing? How do we know? Uh, and I sometimes get walking by organisations ask, what are we doing? So I need to get a person to come in conduct uh, research to find that out. And often, almost always, what they find is they're doing a damn site, and what they thought they were, they just weren't calling it. They weren't counting, they weren't visible to them. Uh, and so people are getting credit for what they're doing, and so on. Um, a, pa uh, a patent to or a proprietary to the um, I didn't know about the Aurora's work in, in as much detail as I do now when I put it together. Um, I have to say I think it's pretty, I think uh, applying that tool is not a case of you know, total top-down stuff, I'd call it from much stuff, because I think it is inherently in that way, but it provides a structure and a framework that you can use in that inductive design step rather than it's uh, not very much a rubber stamp in the at all. So I think I'd probably refer, refer to that, defer to that model that the has developed in that sort of um, uh, scenario. And uh, finally, um, models which you might develop or build in your own organisation, which is very much inductive if you like, asking yourself things like, well, what are our inputs and outputs? This is the sort of programming logic approach that we use in evaluating uh, situations we've done in the book private sector. Um, programs and uh, using what we call outcomes hierarchies, for example, we can interrogate the level of results that we've got from the funding we see. Uh, indicators can be descriptive, indicators can be based on the use of narrative, uh, measures can be against targets, uh, measuring either outcomes or achieving goals or um, um, success in specific targets and so on. And uh, we can look at the degree to which you're measuring as you go, looking at the process of your business if you work and the level of documentation as well. So this model tends to be sort of internal research based, I guess, but one of the again comes back to stakeholder engagement. I think is where we're heading here. Uh, what I characterise as the right field, for me the um, east side, uh, I characterise as formal stakeholders. Now they can be internal or external, but they should be both. And one of the issues I have with um, some of the stakeholder discourse, it tends to regard the stakeholders as them, them out there, with us in here and there's them out there. So I think that's critical for the notion of stakeholder. Uh, and the stakeholder, of course, we define as someone who has an interest in your result, an interest in your, your process. And they're investing 
say, hope you're going to like that, but investment in what you're doing how it works. So uh, most of them, as you know, probably is like in the internal general large firm. But internal stakeholders as well as external. Uh, and some of these are institutional, um, investors and staff, customers of course. Um, if you're a business, then there are commercial stakeholders who pay a lot of attention to the source of your capital, uh, the regular few ones of course, environment and regulation authorities and so on. Uh, institutional stakeholders would include shareholder groups who are often formally organised into a, a, a body that can make representation of part of shareholding groups. Um, increasingly the SRI is socially responsible investment funds uh, standing up as uh, institutional stakeholders uh, and they're often internal committees and board of course being major stakeholders in what you're doing these days. So now this is a bit company oriented and I have to say when I put this together I was thinking more of companies that are very concerned they're getting closer and closer. So I have to ask those who are not the profit sector to think of that model of your internal stakeholders and sort of convert it a bit to people who are our stakeholders. Obviously you have a board, you have internal committees and internal ones and that's a problem. Uh, but your major stakeholders from an external point of view are perhaps less likely to be, say, investors or commercial that have parallels in that area. And of course, your government have a lobby group to deal with, have um, associations with them, so you and ultimately have to deal with uh, them. You need to deal with them, but so you have those uh, stakeholders too. So, on the left field, We've got informal stakeholder groups. I've heard people saying that there's a, this group of groups which are taking an increasing role in talking to us, and talking, especially not for profits, but certainly for all profits too, um, about the interests that they represent. One of the reasons I've asked you to sit in blocks like this is that much of stakeholder work, I think, is not so much individuals, but people being part of blocks of interest and operating from that perspective. So when you think about stakeholders, you probably need to do understand and represent the interest, which may or not be individually will be a lot of So they're increasingly important. I think the technology of the internet has made this huge the case and the growth of access groups is really important as well. Um, and we've listed a few there. Um, I won't walk through them, but you know the sort of groups that I mean. Uh, and increasingly what we're finding is that organisations which are doing things from a corporate perspective are engaging with those who previously had been oppositionist groups coming from that field and having this dialogue and community uh, some very productive work during this community organisation a little while I've done the work with the So the dialogue between the corporate sector and the not corporate sector so that lead field uh, into the corporate system is really important. So my news I guess is that there are these four directions from which come interests uh, which can be addressed through measurement, and this is the space we're in, how I characterise it. Simple kind of approach, I guess, but it helps me get over the question of how you deal with complexity. Increasingly, we're dealing with the complexity of the universe within which we work, and it's a human thing to punch it down into little groups and blocks and numbers. And how many times do you hear, oh, there are three reasons, or there are three this? Just an easy way to think about it. So I'm really coming at it from a stakeholder basis approach. I'm saying to you that in thinking about the measurement, well, in this case, corporate social responsibility related activities, which is anything, I suggest starting with the stakeholder. And some might say there's problems with this around how well this can be structured if we ignore strategy or how well this can be research and evidence based. And I agree with those points of view. But let's let's work our way through it so we think. We'll hear from you soon. Um, I would be suggesting we ask the first question about what your stakeholders need to know so that this investment that they are making in you, and maybe an emotional investment rather than time and money, uh, can be uh, based on uh, a level of information uh, that is as evidence-based as possible. This would be one direction I'd uh, be suggesting you have a, a high value in good measurement. Uh, but you have a reason and the reason I talk to people about well, why are we seeing this as a value is that your interest in your stakeholders is, if you like, a bit uh, functional. It's saying to your stakeholders, well, we want you to exercise that stake in us. We want you to support us in what we do, not blindly, not stupidly, but astutely, in order that we can move on to 
provide whatever it is we exist to provide, whether it's a corporation or a not-for-profit or a new government, as effectively and efficiently and so on as possible. So, well, a small, um, uh, small-scale example of, say, a, a customer complaints mechanism within a retailer, uh, lots of interesting things can come. We've heard, for example, how uh, Westpac have used information coming back from people who have not used certain uh, hearing impaired and sending uh, them to a new product, so this sort of feedback loop is very important. Uh, and thirdly, <coughs> What information do you need to inform decisions? Um, again, I'm a bit touched on this. I argue that if you're collecting information which then sits in the bottom drawer for no good reason, uh, you're wasting your time and hours, and information is primarily a tool for making decisions. Of course, there are accountability issues and so on, but they are solved with. So my argument would be that if you're collecting information, in order that decisions can be made by yourself, but also by stakeholders, by yourself, it's in relationship to strategy by your stakeholders in relationship in relation to how they work either with you or against you to impact on the sorts of results of decision. Uh, and you're probably not going to be achieving all the stakeholders, I argue. So this is again the sort of purposive approach. But not all stakeholders are equal. We need our stakeholders, they will enable us to prosper. Without them we are nothing. Uh, it's essential to be negotiating the space you operate in with your stakeholders and your measurement of what they're doing as part of that negotiation. They've invested in you and heard a lot about values and trust this uh, stuff. But the stakeholders, many of them are investing in you, staff for a very good example, uh, is trust. They trust that there are values for being respected, that I get treated fairly if I provide what is expected of me, uh, and I want to see that demonstrated through the measurement of some sort. Otherwise, I might just go and work for the opposition and take you know, two years of IP with me in my head. And finally, the purpose of measurement in this context, I would say, is around validation, around trust, providing equity. The person who has information about how you are doing sees their interest. It's not one of the customer, the consumer, or the problem maker, but they're being given like equity. They're being trusted in turn to behave reasonably towards you because they have access to that information. I think we all uh, talked about this when we, uh, when we asked about the sort of Enron case, uh, and you pointed out that the external stakeholders uh, did not have access to that internal information that they were managing it pretty to. Had they had that, we would have a whole different scenario with Enron. So that trust was not there, the equity was not there, and we had continuity, absolutely not, we went totally down the road. So again, the purpose of approach is asking how can we be sustainable? My underlying thesis in all of this, by the way, is that we actually do want to be sustainable. Some practical steps. Approaching measurement from this perspective, we need to know what our stakeholders think. Uh, now, we always point, I think it's a good one, that what they think is uh, based on what they know, what they can see, what they have access to. So again, it has to be very much uh, uh, what we call a iterative dialogue. The more they know, the more evidence-based they're thinking will be. So the first round is not going to be the final round. So we're talking to our stakeholders. We're asking uh, what they think about their investment in your future, their future, to the extent they have a stake. And where performance assessment can provide feedback to them uh, and balancing those top down, left, right uh, dimensions so that we're not picking them with just one type of measurement, one type of approach of measurement. Uh, we've used the, the breaded embedded word here. Uh, any performance management system that you create needs to be, on the one hand, objective and demonstrably uh, auditable and defensible. On the other hand, it needs to be part of the way you do things and woven into the system of your organisation so that it's part of the business rather than an uh, agenda. Otherwise, why not? Uh, it needs to be functional, it needs to work well for you. And finally, we have um, the issue of are we doing the thing right is important, the single loop. But the next question is are we doing the right thing? This is a double loop learning piece of using your measurement and evaluation process, not just interrogate the stats and the effectiveness of the processes, but also the able to ask that question. Well, we've done that right, but if it was the wrong thing, we should have done something else. So we need that double loop of information as well. So, on this model, it's a stakeholder-driven approach.
approach. Uh, it starts with the issue of who needs to know what. Uh, and of course, as we said, the part of that is in all of that, so that they may exercise their stake with, um, with the evidence base. In all of that, you may be sustainable because you can't operate in space and something I take away from you. Um, and you may want to um, do some assessment in that mapping of just uh, the rel relative that importance. Not all stakeholders are equal. Um, some are more equal than others, if you like. Yeah, that's Machiavellian about it. We have to understand that some stakeholders are really important, others perhaps less important, uh, but they may be more important in the long term. Some may have urgent issues that we need to pay attention to and tackle them. Others, on the other hand, may be sleeping. Uh, and you will tolerate the sorts of behaviour and problems that they can address or whatever. So you need to understand not just the, uh, the interest of the stakeholders, but how you rate the strength of that interest so that you can balance the relative uh, weight of the different stakeholder groups. Once you've uh, worked through that, uh, you're faced with a raft of potential information that you could provide stakeholders needs to be rationalised down into that which is cost effective to provide, cost effective in terms of your own internal systems, the need you have to map your own it's, uh, strategy, how it's doing, and of course, uh, the demand from stakeholders and how you publish and communicate and so on. So we end up with a sort of triage system, triage, you know this is a metaphor from, uh, from the medical world um, coming out of um, its back to the hospital. Um, this person, no matter what I do, they're going to die, I can't find um, sorry. This person, no matter what I do, they'll be okay for the moment I stick on the side. People in the middle who uh, will survive if you pay attention to them are the ones you put your time into. So this model uh, has some value for us. A bit cruel and heartless, but the uh, um, indicators, we don't really have to, getting out of the nitty gritty, the art of science of indicators. Um, I'm not going to pretend to um, uh, you know, do what really takes a couple of years uh, to graduate undergraduate work on the uh, research methodology. I don't know what that means anyway, I don't pretend to. Uh, but in the sort of work we do, we're always looking for nice, simple indicators. We're saying, well, fractions are really good or metaphorical fractions, if you like. We've got a denominator that says what it is we're measuring and a numerator that says how many of them we've got. So it's sort of a very simple model of what it is that we're measuring and how many you can get in the back, whatever it is. Uh, we use um, uh, what we call a goal attainment scale, which is a scaled approach to uh, setting out in advance what you're trying to achieve and then being able to tell yourself through the collection of the life information, um, I can't go into, I'm sorry, um, how well you are achieving that dollar dollar payment scale. We've started using uh, things called narrative measures. We've developed this with um, the label event ACID. Uh, so they have been in a situation where they can have done this with a lot of qualitative story and information about what worked or didn't work. So we took that notion of story narrative, which is if you like anecdotal and sort of almost case study based and capture the mechanism for uh, providing a, a measurement and adjudication framework uh, and created a thing called narrative measures. So they're having huge success with it, but then for other reasons as you know they got folded anyway. So to make that available to uh, And we're talking about both um, qualitative and quantitative, as um, again, Leora was pointing out the role of fault and fault information can be somewhat different, and you really need both, so they support each other. Uh, and the indicators you use need to pay attention to your inputs, what your spend might be, what your investment is, the processes that you're working through in turning that resource, be it with title or pay, into what it is you provide value again in doing. Uh, and what the impact of the site, what the results are, and what they're doing. And I think that's one where, whether you're working in the not-for-profit sector or the for-profit sector, very much the case in government, I think that's fairly constant, that one. So again, the art and science of indicators uh, is something which uh, many of you will be very adept at, often without any uh, formal approach to it, just from having worked in these fields. Um, I won't really have time to flip through some do's and don'ts, but you can see them could be there, and I think you'll probably know them anyway. And again, it doesn't matter so much what sector you're in there, but there's some quite functional things that you need to avoid or you need to stress in the use of um, this tool, whether it's the north, the east, the west, or the south, uh, and whatever the sort of indicators you're using. Uh, the measurement universe is 
Sydney has many good reefs in it uh, and many very positive areas you can gain more value. This is a sort of do's and don'ts approach of the helps there. Um, just some very simple indicators, and again, I'm sorry, we already keep pointing back to sort of what we've been presenting, but uh, it just fits so nicely. Um, these sorts of things, um, you know, what contribution have we made to the community for a for profit organisation to be um, easy to do sort of input measure? Although, we did find with the London Netmaking Group model, often cash was easily countable. Well, it's a bit of a cliche that you know, that which counts gets counted. Uh, in fact, time was often so great that volunteer time often uncounted by firms uh, that are agents to the not for profit sector and activity was often actually that dollar value much greater than the cash they were handing over, but it wasn't being counted. We had to work out payroll systems to do it. Uh, National Australia Bank, for example, 20,000 staff, and the curve of people who are wanting to volunteer is going up and up and up to the point where it's, it's now being uh, embedded into the payroll system it has to be, uh, which is that systematic approach we talked about. Uh, and so on, these are the sorts of measures you're now becoming increasingly familiar with. Um, this is just a little quick one I just threw on the slide from um, a little index that we've created ourselves. Uh, we've talked in some of the sessions here about value and institutionalising value and the power of putting into the system for the company capital, not the profit, the CSR agenda. In this case, we would ask uh, whether, for example, um, say corporate community investments within an organisation, investments in uh, working with not for profit agents agencies uh, is located at a low, uh, an appropriate level where that responsibility is well placed. On this sort of tool, uh, if no one's responsible, you're going to get a zero. Uh, if, on the other hand, on the, on the right hand side, you're operating at best practice level uh, and top management is endorsing a company wide system uh, and there's a responsibility uh, mechanism, which is not just a policy, but it's something that uh, can be measured and fed back into intelligence gathering system and decision making and making, then we would say that's a best practice. So these sorts of scales are fairly readily put together. Uh, and I would refer you briefly, some of you will be familiar with the, uh, the balance scorecard, increasingly a tool which um, many organisations started out in business, start out with the knowledge economy, understanding that capital is no longer bricks and mortar, it's no longer metal, it's no longer tools, it's no longer products. It's increasingly knowledge, which is a very different economy from one of the 19th century or the early 20th century, and we weren't measuring if you ask for how a company is valued, tends to be valued in the physical capital itself. How do we cope with the linking of vision and strategy to these other dimensions, the financial dimensions fairly self-evident? But what about the, uh, the learning and growth of an organisation? An organisation like all of yours, which is built on growth, on building its growth, on learning, on building the knowledge of IT, how does it measure that? And how does it discover? that's improving on that front. So I think there's a lot for the ballot scorecard in this field. But ultimately, I'll come back to this issue. Are you addressing that to the value? Uh, my perspective here has been stakeholder perspective, so I'm asking that in the context of what the stakeholders value. Have they got enough information in order to exercise what is the value to them in their, through their stake in your activity? Uh, but if you're not asking questions through your measurement system, which goes to the heart of the value of that which you provide and that which the stakeholders want, you'll get, um, you'll get goal drift, you'll get mission drift, you'll get uh, misinformation, not uh, purposefully, but you'll get information about things you don't want to know about, the lack of information about things you do want to know about. So we have to ask ourselves very clearly when addressing our values. Uh, and the intangibles, can we make them tangible? Can we find ways of measuring that which is intangible? We're going to have to wrap, but ultimately it comes down to a vision of the relationship between the for-profit sector, the not-for-profit sector, and some mediation, I guess, in the issue of taxes by government, towards more sustainable relationships between these three sectors, based on, based on trust, but the trust itself needs to be based on evidence, and the evidence needs to be about that which is the value, and understanding what the different stakeholder groups value being able to put measurement against that. From the perspective I'm coming from, the key and the efficient effective management system one which supports not just the sustainability of my business, but the sustainability of this relationship, the planet around it, so the space we all need to be 